Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to see everyone's faces. Looking forward to a really great chat. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for joining us everyone, really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're at 12.02. I'll just wait to, for everyone to come in a little bit more and then we might get started. But thank you again so much for joining us. I might open the chat if I can see it on my screen. It's not coming up. There we go. I've got the chat open. Hi, Angelica. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Rudolph, thank you very much. Please um, use the chat. We'll get to some questions and so on, but we might, we might get the show on the road. Um, okay. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Denise Ravel. Welcome to our Spin Proof Budget Special Live Zoom panel. We present these live Zoom panels on the second Friday of every month featuring various commentators and experts. And thanks to Australia at Home for hosting us. I'd like to acknowledge the unceded Camaragal land I'm speaking with you from. Today, we'll hear from an informed and familiar panel where we'll of course focus on the week's budget and the budget reply, where each panelist will tell us what stood out for them. We'll then ponder how the budget positions each of the major parties and the possible timing of the upcoming election. Joining us today is political commentator, well known, of course, to each of us, Cheryl Kerno. Hi, Cheryl. And also climate lead from the Australia Institute, Richie Merzian. Welcome to you both. Uh, Anthony Clan was supposed to be joining us. I can't find Anthony. I'm leaving messages for him and texting him. Hopefully he'll join us at some stage. Uh, just a little bit of quick housekeeping. Please share your views in the chat. Add any questions to the question room. Uh, we've got a bit to get through, but we'll certainly try to get to some of those questions in the next hour. And thanks to Evan for helping us out uh, by monitoring the chat room. Uh, first up, let's come to Cheryl. Cheryl, thanks so much again for joining us. Uh, Cheryl's a, a great supporter of mine in the Spin Proof podcast, and nice to see you on the Zoom panel. Cheryl wanted to come to you and get your impressions of the budget week, and that, of course, is uh, the Liberal Party's budget and then the budget reply. Uh, the good, the bad and the ugly, Cheryl, over to you. And she's not there. Cheryl, are you there? We seem to have lost Cheryl. I do apologise. She was there a moment ago. Cheryl's muted. Oh, Cheryl's muted. Cheryl, would you like to unmute yourself? She tells me she's on iPad, so hopefully she'll be able to fix that up in a moment. Is that better? Yes, there you are. Good. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> okay, so I read so much about how this was a terrific budget for aged care and childcare, but I found it pretty hard to say that when you've cut so much money out while you've been in government, that you should get instant praise for putting something back simply because you've been shamed by a Royal Commission, for example. So I wanted to um, zero in on a smaller thing, which is increased funding for the Auditor General, because it's nearly the only bulwark we have left um, for accountability against this particular government. At the other end of the spectrum, uh, I thought it was great that a Liberal budget has been called Whitlam-esque and I thought that how much they would hate that. I also thought that Anthony Albanese's budget in reply was not, as Laura Tingle said, flat and not telling us how he was going to make the reforms that he hinted were necessary, but I thought for Anthony, I, I felt some passion. I thought it was good delivery. And if you compare the um, two budgets, the, the 
Morrison Frydenberg budget had absolutely nothing for housing, even though they're arguing that they're still doing things in the background that they've been doing for years. The federal government under the Libs Nats have actually vacated the whole area of social housing. So I thought the Albanese announcement about a 10 billion future fund and what's important for social housing, some for women leaving domestic violence and some for affordable housing. But what's important about the structure of this is that it's a fund in perpetuity. So an incoming government would, uh, if Labor were in government and set it up, <clears throat> excuse me, and then lost government, I think it'd be pretty hard to abolish it. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's my main things. I'm happy to come back and do bad separately. <laughs> and, and there was, well, I thought it was interesting that the Catherine Murphy was speaking about this and she went through it um, at length and said the one saving from the Liberal, from the budget, so the government budget, mm -hmm. on the migrants um, and mm -hmm. not for years. Four mm -hmm. years, actually, yeah. social, um, social services and so on for four years. Um, there's a level of cruelty, I thought, there. I thought, you know, that was quite telling again. And mm. again, ideology is certainly creeping into the into the budget. Um, Anthony, I think, is joining us under the name of Charlie. Evan, have you found him? <laughs> Denise, could I say one more thing about That's the fine. housing? Of course. I forgot to contrast it with, um, as Jane Hume was extolling yet again on Q&A last night, the, I find it a completely ridiculous notion to say it's a great idea to offer a 2% deposit for single parents on Centrelink benefits. I mean, what world do they live in? How many single parents do you know with any savings at all? With any savings at all? Uh, so I, I, was, I was offended by that, but it also said to me, how out of touch, how out of touch elitist and sitting back there thinking that raiding is superannuation, that was their other idea for women trying to leave domestic violence. So either raiding is superannuation or, oh, look at this positive boost we're giving you, we'll give you a lower deposit. Certainly a lot of, just, a lot of just comment last night um, in Twitter from Jane mm -hmm. Hume, but yes, I thought as well that that was very telling. And I always, I, you know, now that they've got audiences back in Q, at Q&A, it's also very telling, I think, to get the audience reaction to comments like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wasn't good. Mm -hmm. Anthony, welcome to you. Thank you so much. Codename Charlie. That's why we had some difficulty finding you. Um, yeah, yeah, that's my computer's name. So <laughs> I'll have to fix that. The secret computer's name. I'll come to you in a moment, Richie. Uh, let's come to you and get your impressions of Richie Mersey and climate lead at the Australia Institute. Um, no, no surprise what, uh, what you're going to comment on in the budget. To me, it's almost like the government went out of its way uh, mm. to, admit, mm. uh, to admit climate change and renewables. What was, what's mm. your... Yeah, it really was quite miserly what the government actually put to renewables. I think we could only find about $20 million directed towards it, another $30 million for a big battery in the Northern Territory. So, so good, but incredibly small, especially when you look at what on the other side of the ledger fossil fuels were getting indirectly mm -hmm. through money for carbon capture, mm -hmm. through money for this clean hydrogen, through these international partnerships. There's $8 billion in fossil fuel subsidies in the budget as well. So it really did seem like it wasn't balanced. Look, and that's the problems that the government wasn't trying to fix, right? The bigger question is like, there's a lot of talk about problems it was trying to fix, but the fix was really only political, right? Mm. Um, it didn't really fix aged care. It didn't really fix yeah. gender equality. It didn't really fix disability care. And then just ignored climate change, ignored wages growth, ignored rising poverty. So you can't really see how for such a big spending budget, it actually did it anything. That's true. I think that that's true, and there's been a lot of commentary, not necessarily from the mainstream, but certainly from the experts in the indie media that, you know, we, we certainly consume probably a little bit more, that says, yes, this is much more about a political fix rather than a fix that in the public interest. Um, what about the Labor policy, Richie? Any quick comments on that? 
I mean, or the, lab, the labor budget reply any anything good in there for the climate oh and, sure i mean and our future. 10, ten thousand jobs, <laughs> jobs uh, in uh, in what are called these new energy apprenticeships uh, is a great idea you know like if we want to i think the way that that albo put it is if we want to not surrender any jobs in the future that we're all building then how do we actually invest in that now you know much like um yesterday um we heard from Nigel Topping, who's the UK high-level climate action champion, so appointed by the UK government to the UN to generate climate action overseas. And he's saying oftentimes, like with Kennedy's moonshot, uh, a lot of the, the, the young people who were listening to that um, while still at school then went on to actually go into university, study what they needed to, to, to contribute to actually getting us there. It's the same thing that I think Albo is trying to do. Like, how do we fund the apprenticeships to build the technologies, to build the manufacturing capacity, to build the future we want so that we can actually go to a safe climate and build that future? And, and with that comes 10,000 apprenticeships to actually target that rather than just bury our heads in the sand. So definitely a, a good sign from Albo on that. And it's interesting that they are framing uh, climate change and renewables as a job opportunity. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that, straight, straight out of the, uh, the US playbook, right? President Biden right. said the climate plan is a jobs plan mm -hmm. and, and went about setting out exactly how to do that. So the space is there. I actually think they probably could have gone further, um, but it certainly wasn't the right direction. And I think that, again, that's been quite interesting commentary this morning. I mean, gosh, Labor can't sort of win in some ways. Mm -hmm. They're really going to be criticised saying, you know, there wasn't much meat on the bones in the budget reply, but we know what happened in the last election when they had too much meat on the bones. Mm -hmm. How can they win? Mm -hmm. Really, again, you know, yeah. quite frustrating for those, that are, those of us that are watching these things. But, but thank you, Richie. We'll come back to you um, in a moment. Anthony Clan from investigative journalists from the Claxon. Uh, and if people don't know the Claxon, then please take a look. Anthony does a wonderful job really deep diving into a lot of issues there. Anthony, uh, the, a big budget week for us. Your views of, of what's been going on? Yeah, I was, I was interested in a couple of, well, a number of points. Um, I'd say that the superannuation stuff jumped out at me just because I've, I've, it's an area I'm, I'm interested in. Um, but there was, a lot, there was just a lot more noise there than was actually of substance as... Um, uh, as as a few people have been saying, as Richie was saying just now, um, I'd say the same thing regarding fossil fuels. I think that's, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to be surprised, but it, it's very concerning that we're still pumping eight billion dollars in fossil fuel subsidies um, when we're looking at um, the, just uh, the expense now of investing in coal or expanding coal assets or even gas assets. Um, is just a waste. So we're, we're going to be stuck with stranded assets in the future, um, given now that it's actually cheap. Solar is actually cheaper than, um, is the cheapest form of energy um, in, in most markets. So uh, that, that to me is insane, but that's just obviously to, to repay the, the donors for the government and also, you know, all, the, all the, uh, the fossil fuel mates connected to the government, which we, we know a lot about, uh, we, we hear a lot about. Um, I'd say regarding... Uh, super. Now, one thing that was interesting, the government sort of now, it's changed its tune a little bit because it realises it can't hide the problems in super um, as much as it could before. So if you recall, like over the past couple of decades, you'll hear the government saying, oh, Australia's super systems, the envy of the world and blah, blah, blah. Um, over the last couple of years, though, there's been a few reports. One, the Productivity Commission did a three year report looking at um, just the returns on super. Um, and as we've sort of mentioned here before and we've, we've looked into quite a lot you've got the two types of funds you've got the industry funds like the australian super and um the ones that are so-called union funds where they're connected to the union movement um as well as employers and then you've got the retail funds which are the major banks so the major bank ones have been robbing everyone blind for you know for decades so now the government's actually come out and said uh we've got problems in super, we've got problems with overcharging fees, et cetera, but it's not talking, it won't discuss the elephant in the room, which is the fact that it's all the banks doing it. And if you stop them doing it, you'd be fine. And it's actually illegal for them to do it. So if they actually just enforce the law, we'd be fine. So anyway, they're, they're, they're getting around that. But it, it, it is interesting that they've extended the, um, they will increase the, the super guarantee or they won't scrap plans to, legislative plans to increase it. I think that's telling. Um, they've they've read the market there and they realise that they're, just, they're on a hiding to nothing to, to going after super that blatantly, although they'll still be doing it around the edges, which they are. 
Uh, and the, the, the removal of the 450 minimum threshold, um, as in, so you get the super 9.5% of this now, you get that on, on all your money, not just if you earn under 450, $450. I don't know why that was there in the first place. So that's a good move. Uh, yeah, that, that were my two takeaways. Or the third one would be regarding aged care. Um, as as we've, seen, we've seen time and again, and it's the same thing. I mean, it all comes down to privatization. Great. That just means getting another party in there. That's going to give you much the same surface, except that they're going to be gouging at the side, the same as superannuation. So, and the superannuation is more direct because it's just money. So it's just figures and you can just see what's happening, um, you know, with the right lens, but with aged care, you, it's the same deal. So they've given all these billions of dollars more to go into aged care and the private operators still don't have to disclose, you know, where it's going, where it's spent, how there's no nurse uh, ratios. So uh, yeah, it's just a political fix for them, which obviously just means it's, it's all about them and not about the public, which is what they're there for. So, <clears throat> I think that's exactly right. I, think, I mean, the point that you raised about superannuation, Anthony, I think um, anyone, again, who's on Twitter and follows Tim Wilson uh, can really see that he's starting to lift his rhetoric about superannuation. And it's like, you know, you can't, you can't buy a house because you can't access your super. So he's yeah. kind of framing it that way. It's, you know, and again, for those of us that have, you know, followed what happened with the franking credits, uh, thing from the from the two thousand from the two thousand and nineteen election, it seems to me that he he's setting up for a similar kind of, of um, to, um, to, and it's all going after those um, those industry super funds. Yeah, he is. Um, he's obviously been given that remit, and he's totally keen on replicating what he did last time. Um, I don't think it'll be successful. He he won't give up, but he, I've noticed he's really dropped back a lot recently. Um, on, on pushing that and because he's so terribly exposed and because they're, they're, we've got the facts now that, that you won't read about it in most of the, the mainstream media um, I've sort of ran into a few brick walls there um, but the he, he is exposed to, to, to sort of go go along with it to any um, further extent I don't think he'll, he'll be successful but the reason why that they are attacking the industry funds so hard so the the coalition is petrified, and I have this from several insiders. They said they're completely petrified about the fact that um, these industry funds are now, it's a power shift. So these industry funds have been doing the right thing for 30 years, have done really well for their members. Those ads where you see the, the two people on the escalator and the industry fund, you think, what well, you know, what not for profit, whatever. They're, they're right. They've been right for years. Um, so they've been doing the right thing. They've got good funds. <laughs> members so now they're in a position where they're controlling investments they've got power in the community because they can decide hey we're not going to fund coal or we're not going to do xyz so that 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 terrifies the government the second part is um the government sees the funds as being union even though the way it was set up they're not union it's just some of their board members are representatives of the of workers which is union reps and some are representatives of the boss it's the employer rep and so some of the union members who are on the boards donate their salary towards the union because they don't they see it's improper because they're using union time to sit on the so the government sees that little bit of cash flow as some major threat um and so there's this ideological they're just terrified of it and that's all it is so they are they're willing to throw five million australians under the bus um have you know basically earned nothing on their their super over 20 years in order to have this ideological battle and have a bit more power that's that's what it comes down to so yeah I agree with it from the, you know, from the bigger picture. That's exactly what it is. It's donor-led, it's ideologically-led, it's all of those things, Anthony. Thank you. Um, I noticed that Cathy in the chat mentions Voices of Goldstein, which, of course, is Tim Wilson's seat, and you're exactly right, Cathy. There is Voices of Goldstein forming in Tim Wilson's seat. Perhaps that's a little bit of a hint as to why he's pulling back a bit. Uh, but who knows? But certainly, um, you know, these independent movements that are popping up in various electorates are very, very interesting right now, um, as I speak about quite often on Twitter. Cheryl, do you want to sort of mention um, a little bit more about the bad of what we well, saw? I, I, well, I, I, want to, um, I want to show my age by saying it was back in 1993 that I, as the Democrats' Treasury spokesperson, negotiated the whole SCG with John Dawkins and Paul Keating. And in the original structure was to get to 10% but over 10 years. Now that would have been 2013. So we had the, we had the, um, no, sorry, what would that have been? 2003. 
nobody did it. We found all sorts of excuses not to do it. But now it's 2021, we're quibbling over 10%. All of the actuarial advice was we probably needed between 12 and 14% to continue to live uh, in retirement, quasi, quasi comfortably um, as with your previous life. But we're 18, given we did have the global financial crisis, but we're 18 years late, 18 years late, and we're not even at 10% yet. So, I mean, I, I'm struck by that every time I think about it. Um, I join with Anthony in saying that the way the aged care stuff is structured is a really bad thing in terms of, first of all, you'll see no change at all for one year. So, and I, I just felt sorry for an aged person who might have been watching the budget speech thinking, oh, thank goodness, we're going to get some relief. But nothing will start for one year. We don't know where all the extra staff are going to come from to give the 200 minutes. And with the $10 increase per resident, as Anthony said, it's not tied. So the government says, oh, they have to report funding. Well, I don't think that's good enough. We've seen all these dodgy reports in the past. We've seen no supervision in the past. Um, so I'm not confident that the private providers who gouge the system already are not going to find some backdoor ways to continue to do it. Um, I think another bad thing was um, no recognition of the need for wage growth to drive economic growth. Um, again, that's a, you know that's a workers' thing. It's a very short-sighted um, approach to ec economics, in my view. But the really bad one. Well, they're two, but the really bad one are the universities. They've been actually singled out for some kind of, I don't know, anti-intellectual thrashing. I mean, thousands of staff have lost their jobs. They didn't get JobKeeper. Thousands of research projects across the country have been cut or stopped, abandoned, can't go on. And yet we've got the same government incapable of joining the dots saying, oh, you know, technology, not taxes, are going to get us uh, towards zero emissions by 2050, when they've cut out the opportunity and the, the, the flow of research that might assist them. And I, I think it's very short-sighted. I think it's deliberately, deliberately punitive for some reason. Surely it's not that uh, anybody who goes to university has a higher level of critical thinking, surely it's not as basic and crass as that. And when Jane Hume said last night, universities are doing well, I think there would have been hundreds of gasps around the country. And then finally, I think um, there was nothing in there for mature age job seekers. And again, showing my age, it was 1998, I did a major piece of research for Kim Beasley which was called 55 plus. Back then, people 55 and over were finding it hard to get a job um, for all the same reasons that exist today, mainly tied up in ageism of some sort. But now it's 50 and below, and we've still done nothing to really address it. The other thing that was conspicuously absent and is a bad thing is the lack of a forward approach to national quarantine. Um, I think it's absolutely clear we're going to have another need for um, a much more creative approach to quarantine, but they don't want to spend the money. The $10 billion war chest. Um, yes, you're exactly right. Oh, gosh. Um, good list of bad things there, Cheryl. That's a good <laughs> thing, to be honest. Thank you. Um, um, I noticed that uh, Joe makes the point about privatisation in the aged care sector. I mean, it really all comes back to that. Um, you know, I often reflect that a lot of this, you know, if you think back to Howard, Howard does seem to be the root of a lot of these yeah. issues. Um, they're all very, you know, symptoms of a neoliberal government. Um, but privatisation is at the heart of it. And I would certainly like to see a lot more commentary about that sort of thing in the media. Sadly, we don't get it. Uh, Beck Hurst, 
makes the point in the chat that as she's a worker in the university sector, she, I think, perhaps deliberately avoided Q&A last night and, <laughs> and saved her screen of her telly. So thank you, Beck. <laughs> Those comments are a bit hard to take. Richie, anything final from you? But I'm also interested in what, in how you think this week sort of frames both the major parties and, you know, there is talk of an election year. Some people are saying that they he might go this year, he might go next year. What's your, what's your view? Sure, just on, on aged care, since, yeah. since that was the last point of conversation, look, the 17 billion over five years sounds like a lot, but it's what, about three and a half billion per year. Yeah. Um, you know, the government spent four and a half billion just propping up the aviation sector. So in terms of government spending, it's not a lot. And it certainly falls short of the 10 billion per year extra that the Royal Commission actually <laughs> recommended, which you could get if you cancelled these stage three tax cuts for high income right. Australians. So at the end of the day, it just shows you the government's priorities, mm -hmm. right? Because it's never a question of whether we can afford it. And the big spending shows you that we can spend as much as we want. We're one of the wealthiest countries in the world, right? Mm -hmm. It's a choice of priorities. And the priority is not going to taking care of people in aged care um, to the levels that are recommended by the Royal Commission, like the $10 extra per head. Where is that going to go? The details were very short. Is it going to go to nutrition, which was horrendous? Is it going to go into the pockets of the private healthcare providers who are complaining about their profit levels, right? So it's the government has missed the mark on this, uh, which is disappointing. In terms of when an election is coming about, you know, I'm happy to take the prime minister at face value on that. If you're saying next year, I reckon it could be next year. Um, Not. <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, like time will tell, but you know, if things are still going downwards, even after a big spending budget, then the government will try and create as much time as it can, get as many vax out as it can uh, to give itself that buffer um, right before it, it does pull the trigger. And so I'd probably be leaning towards that direction um, rather than one anytime soon. I think it's interesting hearing some of the commentary about, you know, the, um, the economy is pretty well pumped up by things like JobKeeper. Uh, by things like not having, um, you know, the, the success that we've had with the vaccine, oh, sorry, the, not the vaccine, the success we've had with keeping COVID at such low levels, all things, by the way, that the Morrison government, you know, they kind of had the we've got to live beside the virus type strategy. If it wasn't for the state premiers mm -hmm. and the first ministers, I really dread to think what situation we might be in, frankly, um, health-wise, but it's curious to me that the government seems to be taking that advantage and seems to be sort of taking that credit uh, mm -hmm. when really I think that we would be in a different position. Um, mm -hmm. So if the, bud if the e economy does start to fall off a little bit, that might be a reason that they might go a little bit earlier. They certainly over at the beginning of this year lost control of the news cycle. That was reflected in polling. That's where the speculation about they'll hold off as long as they can came in. But they do seem to be going up a little bit in oh, polling. Absolutely. Um, we'll see what happens. It's pretty clear from the budget the way the media is going to trip. Um, um, the media commentary from the budget this week, the, the way the mainstream media is going to commentate. Um, is going to commentate. They certainly got the headlines thereafter. So we'll see. The jury's very much out with me. He'll go when he thinks he can win, basically. Um, Denise, can I just interrupt to say that the Canberra Times today has a headline uh, along the lines of Morrison's popularity deteriorating. I don't subscribe, so I couldn't read the whole article. Oh, but I, I read it, Cheryl, if, you, if you're interested. But yeah. basically it was around so there's a the school of social research i think at anu um yeah. have a longitudinal uh survey that they're regularly mm -hmm. carry yeah, out the, and it's yeah. showing that, that there is a deterioration in support for the pm it's actually dropped below the halfway mark i think um and i'd be inclined to take the anu research versus mm. say news poll um, mm. uh, and and in that sense i think there are some fundamental concerns that are being raised and not being addressed i think the handling of, of uh, the allegations in parliament house was the start of it mm. it's just continually rolled on since then mm -hmm. i think it's been quite mixed around this 
um, the criminalizing Australians coming back from India. I yeah. think that was quite mixed in terms yeah. like there was strong views on either side, but uh, but it shows that even on something that they're, they're going out on a limb on, they're still not really nailing it in mm. terms of finding clear winners. And I don't think they've had that firm footing ever since, what, February, March this yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, yes, I saw, I just saw that snippet as well this morning on Twitter and that was very interesting. And of course it is a little bit different to perhaps some of the polling we see mm. through news poll particularly. And of course, again, doesn't reflect necessarily reflect the mainstream media news narrative that we see. So yes, it is interesting mm. to sort of get that more, uh, the results of that more long, longitudinal study. Um, it is a respected poll yeah. um, study. It is a respected study. It's got exactly. years, years of research now. And we can see, again, where they've dropped the ball on so many things from, you know, from climate change is obviously, you know, uh, one area. But, yes, their handling of the pandemic, their handling of the vaccine, now stopping, um, you know, Australians being able to come home. Of course, we saw the budget earlier this week where there were so many gaps and, you know, as we've said, it was, it was quite ideological, also quite catered to their donors and not necessarily the public. Quite predictable for those of us that have followed this government, I have to say. Anyone who follows this government really shouldn't be too surprised by the daily details. Cheryl, uh, the position of the two major parties, and do you think we're in an election year? Absolutely. I, I, um, I was watching Question Time the other day when Morrison made that threat to um, Albanese, He's, he actually said, he was hinting, do you want a COVID election, mate? Um, and I think, they think, they might use the same cover as Gutwein and, um, um, what's his name? Mark McGowan mm. and Anastasia have used. But we're a bit further out. Uh, than they were at the time of voting. But I still think he's keeping it in his back pocket. I still think that $10 billion war chest where it's for uh, to, to deliver decisions not yet announced. Um, and most of the, most of the uh, older journos know exactly where to look for those sorts of things. And they've found this. And I find it really offensive that they are going to use taxpayers' dollars again for Liberal Party campaigning to the tune of nine billion when we've just talked about how the childcare thing is still short, how the aged care changes are still short of what the Royal Commission has recommended and all the other priorities that they've got. I, at this stage, I am in the, he will go as early as he can when it's best for him. Um, and get away with the uh, rationalisation with just enough people. I mean, Gutwin went, was it one and a half years early? And a lot of people questioned that. But at the end, he's got his majority government and uh, people did not seem to mark, enough people did not mark him down for going so early under the cover of COVID. So I think Morrison would do exactly the same thing if he really thought he could get away with it. And I would say before the end of the year. So we've got one, Richie saying no next year, Cheryl saying this year. Um, it's been interesting also to see um, some of the mainstream media commentators. I think Catherine Murphy has very much said that she thinks this is an election budget. She thinks that this is, um, this is a keep your options open budget. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. All right. That, um, but have you noticed how quickly the Libs have got into their pre-selections? Yes. It's quite unusual that they've done... Um, the Senate and other things this early out. I'm just going to grab something to show everyone. Um, <laughs> in North Sydney, we've also had this. So we've had from Trent Zimmerman the North Sydney's budgets, oh, sorry, biggest survey. So I think, again, seeing on Twitter, we certainly were all showing that we're all getting surveyed from our local members. Can I just, mm. can I just note, no Liberal Party logo. Mm. Um, I think that that's the Liberal Party logo has also fallen off the modern Liberals um, websites and I think that that's really telling in itself as well. And um, I saw a tweet, Denise, where um, they were getting uh, robo calls ah, to their phones and emails already from their local member. Right, so something, something. well, I, you know, that could just indicate that they're getting a feel for the electorate and as you, mm. as you know, maybe mm. your options open 
type uh, scenario. Um, did I read this morning or sorry, go on, Richie? Oh, no, I was going to say, if, if we are going to be talking about pre-selection, there is a silver lining here, which is who has now moved to the third spot on the Senate ticket yes. in Tasmania. <laughs> and Queensland. <laughs> ah, Amanda Stoker. In Queensland is Amanda Stoker and uh, Tasmania is Erica Betts, for those wondering what we're talking about. Oh, that would be a fabulous Senate. Joe Barker. <laughs> Senate. Joe Barkworth in the chat, noticeable large advertising roadside posters around for local yeah. ALP member. Who's your local member, Joe? I'd be interested in that. Anthony, your view, how does this position both the major parties and do you think we're in an election year or do you think they'll hold out for next year? My views changed in the past couple of weeks. I think the, Morrison was hoping, oh, look, this will things will get better. I've had a bit of a bad, bad run and I'll push it out. I think what they, he's now realising is uh, things are probably going to get worse before they get better. Um, but um, as, as, as most people are saying, I, I think it's, 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 they haven't made up their mind yet. It's too early to tell. They're going to see how much, things, how, how much further things deteriorate. I mean, it looks like the rot politically for them has set in. So given that, they'd be more likely to, to call it earlier rather than later, given that it's, it's more of a general downward trend. Um, from here to there, I guess what they're hoping on is if, if there's no more major scandals, I mean, between, you know, the next little while. So <laughs> I, I think they haven't made up their mind. It could go, it could be, I'd say 50-50, you know. Um, well, it's, 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 it's not normal, it's not normal to, to make your mind up and have a set date this far out. It's just it's normal to keep your options open and with all these things happening around you and a date in your back pocket. But I'm interested in why you said the rot has set in because I can't see that in some of the people I know. Yeah, I, I, look, I'm, I'm probably just speaking from a bit more of a, um, you're probably living in a bit of a bubble, I guess. Um, just, just, just in terms of just the amount of, the amount of scandal and the amount of, I guess, fatigue that people are sort of seeing with it um, and, mm -hmm. and just regarding the, 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 um, the poll, but, I think they can feel that they're, they're losing it. I think that those more politically astute could feel they're losing it. I don't know that the broader public has as much yet, and obviously they're the ones who are voting, but yeah, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say 50-50. I, I, I think that things will be much worse for them next year than they are now. It's just a matter of wh whether they work that out, when they work that out. Mm -hmm. That's my take. Interesting. <laughs> Beck Hurst in the chat makes the thinks that, you know, whenever, you know, whenever, it's going to be ugly. Um, and I agree. I think it was, you know, disturbing. It certainly, I think, all gave us, you know, my anxiety levels were certainly rising when you could see um, that they're clearly going to, to uh, base this election on warmongering against China. Um, Anthony, you, you sort of have some views, I note, in Twitter often about China. Can you see them, you know, surely they wouldn't pick that kind of fight for real, but they'll certainly scare us all into... Um, you know, keeping, keeping option. Yeah, it's it, that's that was silly on on every front, and I think everyone sort of sees that. I mean, there's many legitimate reasons to to um to to push back against China, with constant bullying, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you've got this 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 little warmongering. It was just a, a short term um, smoke screen, but I mean, it's this really costly one from the national perspective, and it's stupid. <laughs> Um, so I, I suspect they've been behind the scenes, been told to, you know, that's not particularly bright. Um, so they seem to have walked back a little bit from that. And I, it's kind of interesting. I noticed the other day that um, it was brought up that, hang on, we don't, don't have any, any missile defence systems for any of our cities and we won't have for another 15 years or 10 years. So it might be a good time not to, not to be um, mouthing off about war. Uh, yeah, I, there's many legitimate problems and concerns with with the Chinese government, um, but you know, talking about wars is ridiculous. And there's many things that can be said. Um, standing up for uh, Taiwan and not getting the the national policy wrong would be a good start. But yeah, I, I, that was it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, completely ridiculous and you know irresponsible on every level. They're our largest trading partner. Just bizarre. So, so, bizarre. You know, what's, what's what's the gain? I mean, if you if you've got a problem with the stance and, and the the, the um, economic coercion, which is which we ha legitimately have a concern with, um, they should be talking about that, not about just off the cuff talking about a war. I mean, that's just insane. It's 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 sort of juvenile. Um, there are legitimate concerns. Raise them, raise them forcefully, and and um, and don't stand back. But don't be making threats of war. I mean, what's the, what's the point of that?
But, um, and again, as someone commented in the chat, they'll throw everything at winning their, you know, what is it, third or fourth term? I mean, gosh, I hate to think. Um, they'll throw everything at it, shipping at it, and in a fight with, you know, a superpower like China. Um, perhaps they'll do it. Richie, any comments on, you know, the, the, perhaps some of the strategies we'll see in, in an upcoming election? I mean, the, since we're talking about China, the flip side of that is, is while at the same time they're saber rattling towards China and just really diplomatic faux pas, on the other side, you have the United States and the UK and the EU all telling Australia, we really want you to get on board with our climate agenda. We're hosting you know, a big meeting at the end of the year. We want you to increase your target in the next 10 years. You said you know, it's easy to meet and beat your target, so then go further. And then you have Australian posturing to, you know, that just backs in more fossil fuels. And it's, yes. not even, it's not even to the benefit of the existing coal and gas communities, right? There's 23 new coal mine proposals in New South Wales that yeah. will cannibalize the existing labor force and demand right when demand is flat or going down because our trading partners, China, Japan, Korea, all have agreed to phase down their fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have some sensible comments from people like Malcolm Turnbull saying, hey, maybe we shouldn't open up new coal mines until we look at this more holistically and then mm -hmm. being fired from panels and 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 marginalized more broadly so it, it just doesn't seem to make sense from either end you, you're both antagonizing china but at the same time you're not really working with your allies either and so you're sitting in this awkward middle that doesn't seem to serve either purpose and we mustn't forget how much um iron ore underwrites this particular budget and the assumptions around how long that might go for. I mean, previously they didn't assume it was going to be four times its normal price, so we don't know what's ahead with that. I think the other thing about um, when Morrison will go to an election, I noticed Alan Cole has said that in all their forward estimates, next year is the best year for them and that there'll be a real um, debt bomb for whoever's in government, I think he said in 23, 24. And uh, I see that as another reason, another part of their strategic planning for when to go to an election. And if they lose, to leave Labor with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yes, well, and, you know, we know that this, well, we know that, you know, quite often they will leave various bombs uh, for, the, for the following government to clear up. Um, that's been, you know, quite a well-known strategy. I think that we know, I can't remember anything that comes to mind, but I, my feeling is that they were expecting to lose the 2019 election. Yeah. And there were various things that they were leaving for Labor to, you know, be in a bad position for, perhaps positioning them for as a one-term government. Um, so, yeah, interesting. Look, we'll see. Um, I suppose I'm sitting here thinking, look, you know, again, we know these issues. And a quick question, perhaps a little bit without notice, what are the solutions? I mean, it's all very well for us to raise the alarm and, raise, you know, raise these issues. Where's the, you know, raise um, the emergency? Where's the emergency exit? What's a path for, a practical path forward we can all take? It's quite clear to me that the mainstream media, just even based on the commentary this week, they're going, they were very supportive of, you know, a government that's gone into trillion dollar debt uh, and so on. We wouldn't have seen that for a Labor government. We didn't see it when they went into GFC. Um, Anthony, being someone that's come out of the mainstream media for a long time, any quick comment on the mainstream media commentary you saw this week? Oh, yeah, it's, it was pretty depressing. Um, the, I, I'd say, I mean, in terms of the exits, I mean, we know what the answers are. Um, many of them are simple. I mean, we've got to get rid of donations. The, the capture that, the, you know, a few bucks can buy you a few thousand or 20 grand or something or 100 grand, which is nothing, um, can buy you, a, you know, a, a billion dollars worth of subsidies. And that's sort of the, the, the payoff. Um, so we've got to get rid of donations. Um, we've got to improve transparency. We've got to not give money to private aged care providers without them actually producing financials. We're not going to give money to um, aged care providers that are based in tax havens. Um, just simple stuff. I mean, that's a stroke of a pen. A lot of it's just a stroke of a pen, but it's got to have uh, it's got to be making them do it. And the way to make them do it, the only way to make them do it is to make the public aware of it. And the only way to make the public aware of it is to have a free media and have an unbiased media. So that's the, so you sort of keep going around in a loop. Um, so I, I, just, I think the only way that it's going to improve is, is if, if there's 
better independent or more independent media or more people accessing independent media and and then growing and growing that base because we know the mainstream media people have had it with the mainstream media increasingly they're frustrated when they, they say media but they mean mainstream media so there is that um that that this disenfranchise um with the existing media so it'll i think things will gradually change i'm optimistic but as independent media grows and grows and becomes the mainstream media then then we can start fixing some of this stuff in the interests of everyone rather than the vested interests um because they've been around so long they're just completely systemically broken and i mean nine fairfax i mean you just gotta look what's happening there um and that was sort of one of the last holdouts so that's really good. Exactly. and of course um anthony runs a great website with a lot of really great um articles in investigative journalism, so please everyone support the klaxon. Um, Richie, any any optimism from you, just quickly before we move to final observations? Uh, it's hard to be optimistic on the climate and energy front, but so, at least domestically. But I I get that that motivation overseas. You know, like the mm -hmm. UK, right, which is the um, yeah with the birthplace of coal-fired power is now down to just 2% of their yeah. electricity coming from coal. They're going to close down before they hit their target of 2025. Like what, what wasn't, didn't make the news this week is that quietly um, Maurice Payne, the foreign minister met with the secretary of state in the U S Anthony Blinken and John Kerry, who's a special envoy for climate. Now they didn't make the news. Um, it would happen behind the scenes because the U S is having many of these meetings as is the UK, as is the EU around pushing Australia behind the scenes. So whilst it might not look publicly like Australia is doing a lot, it is privately quite concerned and there's a lot of encouragement up to a certain point in diplomacy. And then it turns into just far more forward leaning language. And you're going to see that in the lead up to the G7, right, which the UK is hosting in the second mm -hmm. week of June, um, where there'll be talk around border adjustments. Uh, there'll be talk around how some of the free trade agreements will be impacted. And suddenly a lot of the sort of more moral arguments on climate that haven't been impacting the federal government will turn into economic arguments. And, mm. and then you'll start seeing a, a lot more of a stronger reaction and response. And hopefully that will move and empower the moderate liberals to actually speak up. Yeah, hopefully. Um, being, being someone who's in a seat um, held by a modern or a moderate liberal, haven't seen a lot of talk, haven't seen a lot of walk. So, exactly. um, and this is including on electric vehicles, Denise, right? Which your, <laughs> your MP and a number of modern liberals talked up and said transport is the way to go. We need to invest in electric vehicles. There wasn't a single dollar for electric vehicles in the federal <laughs> budget. What you have instead is Victoria, South Australia, New South Wales, all looking at taxes on electric vehicles. So you have this perversity in how we're dealing with a technology that's ready to go. We're a car taker, not a car maker. They're coming, and instead of incentivizing the cheapest, um, latest models, uh, they're not coming here. Manufacturers aren't sending them here. Um, and that's something that the federal government and state governments could be doing to change it, and they're not. Car taker, not a car maker. <laughs> well said, Richie. That's a, that's a good slogan. Um, yes, so the optimism is perhaps the pressure from overseas, uh, rather. And, you know, my thing is vote. Everyone, please organize, vote. Um, as Anthony said, you know, some of these issues are a flick of a pen um, and would make a difference, but we need to get a government in there willing to do this. Um, Cheryl, any sign of optimism? And then I'll come around to everyone for a final observation. Please give us some optimism. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't see too much. Um, I'm disappointed with um, Labor's responses to climate change. Um, I understand what they're playing at and I understand the Hunter by-elections on very, very soon, but I think you've got to fight for your point of view and I think it's hard in the Labor Party when you've got some really militant unions. Um, is Labor ready for an election would be, that would be another point that I'd like to ask. I'd like to be really optimistic and say as from last night, I got the impression that they were much more on their toes. That gave me a little bit of a cause for optimism. Um, I'd like to see uh, more people standing who would bring um, more sense to the Senate than Malcolm Roberts and co. Mm -hmm. And an optimistic scenario might be a hung Senate where they can uh, put abolishing electoral 
um, donations as as part of their their um, agreement to support government. I mean, the major parties are not going to do anything about that. It benefits both of them. So the only way we got fixed terms in New South Wales was when the independents uh, gave that to John Fay as a part of their bargaining chip. So I, on the policy front, I can't see much that this government's going to leave as a positive policy legacy. I really can't. All I can see them doing is trying to undo things that have been done in the past or setting up future um, neoliberal solutions to all the things that have bothered us. So I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful, but not optimistic. You tried, thank you. Um, Evan, Evan makes the point that more sense than Malcolm Roberts and co is a very low bar. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Ben Cheryl. Um, look, I'll just say one good thing that I noticed out of the budget uh, from the government's point of view, $15 million for AAP. They're an important part of our media landscape, oh. being a, um, a news wholesaler. I thought that was the one green shoot that I could actually see. And I know some of the people involved in AAP, they're a great team and they would have worked incredibly hard for that. Um, so thumbs up for that at least. Um, a bit of optimism from me, these independents, anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I do feel a bit of hope uh, about the rise of these grass, community grassroots groups popping up in about 29 electorates around the country. Uh, my own seat of North Sydney is one of those. Getting more indep real independence on the crossbench um, in the next election, I think, could be positive. Anyone who watched Q&A last night with Helen Haynes can see mm. sensible voice. Uh, she is on so many issues from climate change to federal ICAC. Mm. That is certainly where I see a glimpse of hope. Um, and I'm certainly working quite hard in my own seat toward that goal. Uh, but let me come to you, Anthony, before we finish up for a final observation. Uh, yeah, I'd just say, well, optimistically on the climate front, I've been doing quite a bit of work on that at the moment. It, 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 the coal is, fossil fuels are going. Um, it's, it's just a matter of the timing and how much damage is done. And the damage um, manifests in how much it costs everyone because it's the, the, the costs of doing nothing or not doing as much as is required is enormous, which we know. Um, but the Australian, looking at all the different graphs, you've got the US and um, the major coal producers all, all pulling back, um, except for the emerging economies. Uh, but Australia is going the other way and looking to to sign off on more coal mines. So I, I, whether that's going to happen, I don't reckon it will um, for a lot of it. Uh, and also I noticed recently, well, Adani is having problems all the way through trying to finance it. The Indian government was going to, and now they're not committing to it. So I don't know. I noticed that a couple of days ago in Indian press. So it, it's, it, I think um, it, it will reduce. And I think at some stage, the, the government, whoever it is, it might even be in six, 12 months, it's going to be standing there um, <laughs> looking, look, just, just sort of looking at all moving without them anyway. And they're going to look pretty stupid. So there's going to have to be a pretty quick change because the, 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 the cost of solo is just falling through the floor. And so that's a fantastic news for the world. But it'll be interesting to see how that, how that pans out. But I think that's one, that's one positive is, is te technology taking over the, the broken ideology. Uh, good. Uh, good. A couple of people in the chat also recognising that the ABC yeah. in the budget. So, you know, something else again, ideology. The ABC has now seemed to, seemed to be an attack, an attack, you know, since, well, should we say Howard? Uh, but certainly since the Abbott government formed government in, in 2013. Richie, coming to your final observation. Yeah, I just posted it in the chat basically the, the federal government spent more money on on uh, on the, the oh, fuel tax so credits than on the australian army like it's a huge amount of money that that, that is just going oh. uh to, to prop to prop up the use of diesel and nothing around reducing our liquid fuel usage which ironically whilst australia is the largest coal exporter the largest exporter of liquefied natural gas we are incredibly fuel insecure when it comes to petrol and diesel and aviation, and yet the fixations on securing supply in the US, which has its own dramas, uh, rather than actually lowering demand here. And I just think there's, there was more money going to liquid fuel security and just shoring up supply and nothing on demand management. I think that's a real gap. But leaving it on a positive note, the one thing that wasn't in the budget, which is good, is funding for a new gas-fired power station in Curry Curry in the Hunter. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Everyone expected mm-hmm. a cash, a cash injection to Snowy Hydro, which is a it's a which is a government corporation to build that gas plant, even though the market says it's not necessary and the private sector don't want to really build those things anyway. Um, and so we didn't see money for Snowy Hydro. So the government was all worried because everyone was thinking this project was dead and then quickly got the Daily Telly to do a front page splash around how they would potentially fund it out of decisions taken, but not yet announced. But there's no mm. real detail. There's no clarity there. And I don't necessarily think it's going to stack up either. So to some extent, it's, it's hard to find coal. It's getting harder to find gas. Uh, and we are starting to see a shift. Now we just need to make sure that, that we get a lot more money behind renewables. Good. Thank you, Richie. Um, And again, you know, where's the media would be my call again. People who follow me know that I often put the media layer onto my commentary. Uh, The fourth estate is a pillar of our democracy and we need them. We need them now more than ever. And it just feels like um, a lot of them aren't stepping up to the plate in the way that we need with this government. Cheryl, a final observation from you. Well, it's indirectly related to the budget because it's the government accepting Andrew Lamming's vote and Andrew Lamming reneging on what he said he would do. He said he would resign from all parliamentary positions. And yet in Parliament this week, when Labor moved to have him dismissed from being the chair of, I think it was the Education Committee, um, every single person in the Liberal Party, including Senators Henderson and Katie Allen, who's a Reps member from Higgins, who had been on Insiders saying they were very uncomfortable with the thought of even being in the party room. They all voted, well, sorry, Katie, Katie Allen's the only one in the Reps. They all voted for Andrew Lamming to retain his positions, 22,000 extra a year for being that chair, but also his vote. And I have a very clear memory of Pine and others rushing out of the chamber to reduce the numbers so that they didn't accept um, Craig Thompson's vote when Craig Thompson was in a mess uh, when Julia Gillard was prime minister. And I just think utter hypocrisy. Um, I also think it's an issue which people who don't pay attention can grasp quickly. Uh, I think they know that this person took these photos. They know that he's harassed women. They don't need to know the intricacies of tainted votes, etc. I think they know that the government is hanging on to this person for reasons that aren't acceptable. So I, I see that as um, an indirect positive that people will understand it. I'm wondering whether they might use uh, that as if Morrison might use that as a reason to go to an earlier election. Um, Like Gutwin did, Gutwin did. did. Really echo that similar thing. Mm -hmm. We need to have more certainty, so we're going Mm -hmm. to lecture it now. Anyway, watch this space. Um, What I would say to everyone is please um, engage. Certainly everyone who's listening to this is already engaged, but organise and, of course, vote. Um, I think we all know how important the outcome of the next election would be. I just wanted to give a quick shout out as my quick final observation to the mouse plague that's going on in our region. Mm -hmm. Um, I did see something quickly this morning that uh, that Landline will will be featuring that in the um, episode, but it just looks absolutely horrendous. There was some commentary again saying that if they, um, you know, some of the chemicals that they're thinking of using uh, to eradicate the mouse plague is going to affect both domestic animals and wildlife. It just looks like a situation that's completely out of control. And again, is it impacting, um, you know, the farmers that have already been so badly impacted by drought and climate change and so on. Um, But yeah, just awful. And it's curious to me that we haven't seen too much commentary from it. We certainly haven't seen the politicians talking about it. But, yeah. Where are the National Party on this, huh? Exactly. Well, you know, they're the the, the party for miners, not for farmers. We know that. Um, So we're just on the hour now. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining. It's been a really uh, good chat as well. I want to say thank you to to the panellists for joining us. Uh, Cheryl Kernow, Anthony Clan from the Claxon. Please go to the Claxon um, and subscribe and, and watch Ant, uh, Anthony's very good work. And of course, to Richie Mersey and the Climate League from the Australian mm-hmm. Institute. Thanks so much, 
uh, for joining us. Thanks to Evan for helping out in the chat uh, and everyone for joining. Now, next Friday, instead of the Spin Prove Live podcast, um, I'm going to go to the school strike for climate uh, protest here in Sydney. So I'll be live streaming that from my Twitter account. So please, if anyone wants to watch, then come and find me on Twitter. Um, the live podcast will be the following week. I haven't got the guests sorted out yet. And of course, we'll be back next month with another panel. So thanks so much. Denise, Denise, don't get knocked over. Oh, well, yes, Again, anyone who follows the, the last, well, actually, the time before last of my protest, someone fainted on me while I was live streaming and broke my ankle. So, yes, I must admit, I am very aware now of who's in my immediate presence when I go and protest. Um, but thank you, Cheryl, for caring about that. Last of all, after my protest, I got very sunburnt. So hopefully, um, hopefully... Um, I've sort of got the protest down pat, but I need to get better at it. Um, but well done to everyone who's getting involved in that school strike for climate. It's wonderful. And again, on Q&A last night, it was wonderful to see so many young people yes. sort of aware um, of the issues that they're facing. I truly do think it's younger generations that are going to come in and save us from, from all of this. Um, but we'll see. So again, we're just past the hour. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, thanks coming in what a really um, interesting discussion. And we'll be back next month, next month. Um, but thank you. See you soon. Come and follow us on Twitter. We have some good discussions there as well. Thanks, everyone. Hope you enjoyed the chat. Have a nice weekend. And as I say to everyone, um, hang in there. What other choice do we have? We've just got to keep, keep doing what we're doing. Yep, it's true. It's true. Um, but thanks to Richie. Thanks, Anthony. Really interesting discussion. Appreciate the time you've given us today. And thanks, Hannah, too, for um, being in the background. And Evan, as always, wonderful in the chat and making sure that, you know, that the chat is coming along quite well. Um, but everyone, please vote um, and get behind some of these independents that are happening in about 29 electorates. It's really um, exciting, I know, what's going on in North Sydney. Richie, are you still there? Yep. On local, I'm up in the Hunter Valley and uh, on the, um, cold, on the um, power station at Curry, mm -hmm. my local member who's Labor, Merrill, was on our local news um, bemoaning that it wouldn't be being built. I was Really? Was uh, this last night or? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, like we're getting, you know, like obviously that like, you know, Taylor's office was obviously backgrounding journos to try and get that that puff piece like what was in the Daily Telly. Mm. Um, but we saw how the Sydney Morning Herald was reporting on it or the Finn or, uh, you know, or um, other outfits. Uh, they weren't really taking it up. Like basically, there, if there was a 30th of April deadline for the private sector to come forward with gas plants, they didn't. That's the time you announced that Snowy Hydro is proceeding. They didn't. Mm. They didn't give mm. it the green light. Snowy Hydro hasn't given it the green light. They haven't given it budget financing. Now, if this story is true, that it's going to come out of the three, four billion dollars left over um, in decisions taken and not spent, and it costs around six hundred million dollars, why is it coming out as a cash injection directly? Mm. It's quite questionable if the project mm. is in such a dire mm. state that they need the cash to fund it rather than taking mm. out a loan when interest rates are so low. I um, don't think so. And there's some really serious questions. Mm. So I, I'm mm. not sure what's going on, but it, it's certainly becoming a dog's breakfast mm -hmm. and yeah. i thought the puff piece was really just to back in the mm -hmm. by election um, yeah, yeah. Given, yeah given it is so close and it's a clear signal rather mm -hmm. than anything concrete yeah. there's nothing concrete really to hang your hat on right now yeah, yeah. yeah. i agree yeah. totally agree thank you thanks everyone thanks bye. again bye